Okay, so uh, glad to have everybody back. Let's do our last session of the day. And we would also like to welcome our folks that are, are watching on our live stream today. Uh, welcome to the International Bowling Campus. You are about to take part in one of the sessions at the Bowling University School for uh, Bowling Center Management. So we have uh, some of the best and brightest here from around the country and literally around the world. And we've been spending all day on marketing and we've got about 45 minutes, maybe no more than an hour, that we're gonna talk about one of the hottest products that we have out right now, specifically for generating new, new league business, but also creating trial as well. And that's Bowling 2.0. So uh, as part of your tuition here at the, the campus for the, for the week-long school, everybody is going to leave with a Bowling 2.0 kit. So I've got a little session today that I want to go over with you. And for those that are, that are watching at home, that really is going to give you a brief overview of what the program is, but more importantly, how to put it in, into place, okay? Uh, because this is literally a turnkey program that you could, if you wanted, go back to your center and start promoting next week. It literally is kind of in, in that box. So uh, very quickly, I just wanna let you know a little bit about just kind of the scope of the program and how big it is right now. Currently, there are over 1,500 bowling centers uh, in America that have Bowling 2.0. We just have launched it in about 100 centers in Australia. Uh, it's been translated into Japanese. There are 60 bowling centers in Japan that have translated the uh, material. And we are now in negotiations with the Chinese Bowling Association to have it transfer, translated into Mandarin and also some of the European countries as well. And the reason I mention that is it just goes to the success of the program that it doesn't matter what the culture is, doesn't matter where, where your center is located in America, doesn't matter if you're on a military base. This is a program that works everywhere because it meets that need of taking non-users, letting them sample our product and then converting them into users. And that's really what this is about, uh, doing that. So let's go ahead and get started. So in kind of in the spirit of Stephen Covey, I'm gonna start with the end in mind. So if you asked me the elevator speech of what is Bowling 2.0, in its simplest terms, here's what it is up on the screen. It's a four week learn to bowl program designed to introduce new adults, 18 and older, to bowling or reactivate bowlers who have not bowled in several years. Now, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, the project team that put this together was charged with the task of how do we generate more adult league bowlers in America specifically to start out with. Um, and this is where we landed with, with the program. Now, much as the case with many of the programs we do in our industry, it gets used for a lot of different categories. There are bowling centers today that are using this for youth, perfectly fine. There are bowling centers today that are using this for seniors in the daytime, absolutely okay. There are bowling centers today that are using this for their university, their PE programs, their high school. All of that is okay, and all of that is great, great stuff. So you're gonna find and use this for other things as well, which is, is perfectly acceptable. But as we go through our short time here today, I want you to know the end goal, and that end goal is how do I generate more adult league bowlers? Because that's what most of us need. Most of us today are saying, how do I get more adult league bowlers? And this is the program that can help, help us get, it, get there. But I fully realize that there are other applications for this, and all of them have been very good and very successful as well, okay? The other thing that I will share with you is that the idea of teaching people to bowl in four weeks is really nothing new. In fact, this program is really a uh, updated modernization, if you will, of a program that was in our industry 40 years ago. So uh, in, in the 70s, when new daytime ladies leagues were being started, and we had hundreds and hundreds and thousands of daytime ladies at that time bowling in our centers across America, it really started with this program. It started with taking mom, who was typically a stay-at-home mom with kids, letting her sample bowling for four weeks, and then on week five, converting her into some type of a daytime ladies program. Many of you across the country that have bowling centers, especially if they're 20, 30, 40 years old, at one time you had probably had a room that was dedicated for the playroom, right? Where you kept the kids. And you've thought today, why do I have that playroom? Well, you have that playroom because 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when daytime ladies started, that's where we kept the kids while mom learned to bowl during the daytime. So this is really a program that has had some proven track record. Now we are uh, making it with today's technology, with today's new user in mind, understanding that today's guest is a little different than they were 40 years ago. So uh, this is a proven program that we've, we've modernized uh, today. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about what's the elements of the program and what's in the kit, if you will. 
because um, we really need to understand that before we can get started. So if you purchase a bowling 2.0 kit through BPAA or if you attend the management school and it becomes part of your curriculum, you're going to get this, uh, this kit that's going to have all the elements you need to get started. And all of our students here, you're going to leave with one today after we're finished. So one of the things that comes with it is a 3 by 6 banner. Okay, that's included. Uh, 22 by 28 poster that I have a sample of the poster over here for you so you can see it. Um, we've also put a little care package here for you with some various, various elements. I'm going to spend just a few minutes. We've put some samples of some different types of POS for you. Uh, table tents, uh, what I would call rack cards that you would see at a hotel, the little third page uh, flyers. Uh, we put some samples of some eight and a half by 11 flyers, both color and black and white. Uh, here's a sample of the third page rack card that I, that I mentioned as, as well. Um, we have put a coach's guide in here. This would be for the person that you designate that would be responsible for facilitating the program. Uh, so if somebody didn't have the benefit of watching this session or attending the school, it would help them to know uh, how to facilitate this. And it's a nice resource guide for you when you get back to your center. Uh, probably one of the most important elements is the proprietor's guide. This is your complete resource, and it's what most folks, if they order the kit through, through us and haven't been able to sit in a session like this, is what they are dependent upon to learn about the program and, and execute it. So by being here today or watching online, you're going to get a little added extra of some how-tos on there. But this is a great resource for all of you to, to fall back on. Um, one of the things that we thought was important with the project team was to have a take-home for the student. So we have put together a handout that is designed to be given to each of the students in the program. And of course, since we have four lessons, there's one for week one, week two, week three, and of course, week four. And in your kit, we have uh, copied 50 of these for you, so you have enough to get up and started for your first 50 students. Okay. After that, I'll talk in just a second about how you get additional copies. Uh, I've co I sent a, less, a copy of Lesson 1 around, so all of you here today at the university, you have a copy of Lesson 1. I'm going to go through that in a little bit as um, we talk about the elements and how we use that in the program there. Now, the last element that we have actually in the kit for me is the most important, and it's what I refer to as the secret sauce. This is the DVD that has the four video lessons on this. And this, for me, is what has made this so amazing and so popular around the world because it, uh, it fills that void of being able to, to do the teaching. Now, I will tell you, some of you spend a little time with me now. Um, I, I'm not a bad bowler. I'm not a great bowler. But I have no business teaching bowling uh, to somebody without, you know, the, the aid and the resource of this, these video lessons. Um, if I was to ask all of you at home or ask all of you here, who thinks teaching people how to bowl and improving their skills and improving their experience is good for bowling? Every hand goes up, doesn't it? Nobody says, hey, Bart, that's a pretty dumb idea. Why would we do that? Why would we teach people how to bowl? Every hand goes up, and we know that's, that's a good idea, right? It's, it's kind of like, for me, diet and exercise. If you said, hey, Bart, you know, who thinks that uh, eating better and exercising a little bit is good, good for you? It'd be a good thing. Every hand goes up. But then I asked the follow-up question of that is, well, why don't we do it? Well, in the case of diet and exercise, life gets in the way, doesn't it? You know, we have all things happening, and I, I, I was going to exercise this morning, but I got busy. I was going to eat right, but boy, those brownies looked good that Bart was passing around at lunch and, you know, all those things. So just life gets in the way. Now, in, in, in our space of bowling, if I asked the question to you, hey, Austin, you just said that teaching people to bowl was a great idea because it'll, it'll help business. Why don't we do it? Well, the answer to that is we don't have enough certified coaches in America. And, we, and for that matter, we don't have enough certified coaches around the world. So there are a lot of programs out there on the market that try to teach people how to bowl. The difference is they don't have the ability of the video lessons to be able to allow BART or people like me to facilitate this program. Okay? So uh, that's really the equalizer. It makes it BART proof that anybody, if you have a good personality and you enjoy people and you know just a little bit about bowling, you can facilitate this program. In fact, I will tell you something that, and I love coaches, if you have the heart of a coach, if you're watching or you're here and you have, you're a coach, you have the heart of a coach, that is a, a wonderful gift. I applaud that. But here's what I know and here's what our research and our data shows time and time again. And I want you to, to listen to what I'm saying. A good coach, world-class coach with a little bit of business knowledge will not perform near as successful with this program as a, a good business person that's good with people and a little bit of bowling knowledge. 
And you may not believe that now, but hopefully you'll believe that by the time we're done going through this, and I'll share with you why, because our data just shows that. Now, there's a point in time where when this program has to be handed off to somebody that is a gold, bronze, or silver level coach, or, or level one coach, and we need those folks. And boy, I wish there was 20,000 more coaches in America, but there's not. So if, if we're going to teach people how to bowl, it's incumbent upon us at the center level, we have to do it ourselves, don't we? And we have, to, we have to have the aid. So this is the secret sauce. And what I'm going to do here today with our group here at the university is I'm actually going to take you through a lesson just like you were my class. And I'm going to prove to you that anyone can do it. Because if I can do it, then you can do it, right? And as we've been training people around the world, we've been taking new people that know very little about bowling, but are just super great with their attitude and their personality and their willingness to go down and talk with folks. And they've been able to engage these 2.0 students and teach them the basics of, of how to bowl. Make sense? Now, there are elements in today's marketing toolbox that we need that we can't put in a box, right? There are a lot of other elements that have to do with uh, digital and web technology and email and all those things that uh, are important with today's marketing that, that we can't put in this little box. So all of that stuff is available and it's available for you online. Um, so I'll show you in a minute where to find that. We've created an email template, a website ad, a 30 second promotional spot. We've created a Facebook post, uh, all things in there that in this digital space now, you as, as an operator having access to this program, you now can go get in, and use in there, okay? Now, one of the key points that the team had to come to as we were putting this together to take it to market is what happens when you have your 51st student. What happens if you want to use a table tent? What happens if you want to customize one of the flyers? Well, one of the things that we didn't want to be in was the print business, and we didn't want to be in the warehouse business. We wanted to be in the solution business. So in order to do that, we've provided you all of the templates, and then you customize them yourself and print them to your standards and your specifications. So by having access to the program, you have access to all of the native files that you go online, and then you, you customize yourself. So you could literally tonight, when you went back to the hotel, you could log online, pull up this flyer in either a Word document or a PDF, edit your information with your center-specific information, and send it off to Office Depot and have it printed or printed at your bowling center, right? You have all of the files as it relates to the table tents. If you wanted to set that up and send that to, a, to Office Depot to print or print it yourself, you could do that. You could then go and uh, the PDFs are there for all the lesson plans. The, the, uh, if you say, hey, Bart, I love posters. I'm a poster person. I love posters all around my center, but one's not going to be enough. There's a, a print file ready to go, 22 by 28, that you just send to Office Depot. You print it. And you could make a dozen of them, two dozen of them. You may want to get more, more banners. So we don't want you to have to depend on us to supply you additional supplies. This is kind of your, your startup package, if you will. And all of the material is going to be online. And I'll show you that in just a second. I mentioned that we created a 30-second uh, promotional spot. I want to show you that now. And then we'll talk about uh, how you can use it. It's as easy as one, two, three, Four. And this opposite arm helps maintain balance for the whole body. Introducing Bowling 2.0, where in just four weeks you can be bowling better and having a lot more fun doing it. Whether you're brand new to the sport or just want to learn more of the fundamentals, Bowling 2.0 is here to help. You now have access to some of the best coaches in the world with video lessons sure to improve your game. I'm going to show you the proper way to do it. Give us four weeks and we'll give you your new favorite pastime. Join the Bowling 2.0 movement. Classes are now forming right here. Sign up today. Okay, so you can see that is a uh, quick video spot. You could use that through social media. You could send it out as a tweet. You could post it on Facebook. You can uh, put it on your website. And I think that all of us as small business operators, I think that's pretty professionally done. It, it makes a good representation of bowling, a good representation of your facility. You'll notice that it's not specific. It says nothing about the location. It says nothing about any cost or free. It just says, hey, get excited about bowling. If you want to learn in four weeks, here's where to go. And then you, we want to lead them to you that you fill them on your center specific information, whatever that is, right? So you want to know where you can go to, uh, to get this. And that, uh, that HTML code is with all the other materials I mentioned on. So you may want to take, take a note here. If you go to bpaa.com, if you're not familiar with your uh, website as a member, bpaa.com, 
you'll see in the upper right hand a button there for login. When you click on that login, it's going to ask you for a username and a password. That username is your BPA member number. Every one of you is a member. Your business has a unique number. If you do not know what that number is or you need to get that number, Rich at BPAA can email that to you, R-I-C-H at BPAA.com, and just let Rich know you, you need to know your BPA member number. That member number is unique to your center. The password, the default password for everyone is BPAA lowercase, okay? Uh, you can, if you choose to, after you log in, you can change that password if you'd like. Uh, you don't have to. There's no private information. There's no financial information. It really is meant to keep non-members away from benefits and random hackers and surfers and spy bots. Uh, but it's not anything real secure back there. But it's just the ability to, to log in and see member-only things. I will tell you as a sidebar, if you've not logged into the members-only section, there's a tremendous amount of material there for youth, for tournaments, for day camps, all kinds of great stuff. The youth team is going to be here with you uh, day after tomorrow. Uh, but even if you're listening, at home, I will tell you, log on to that site. There's a lot of great information. But specifically for us, as it relates to 2.0, when you log in, it'll take you to this 2.0 page and you'll see coach's guide, PDF. Click, I can download it and it's yours. All the promo video, the HTML code, whoever does your website can copy and paste that HTML code and they can put that on there. And it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not complicated. Now look, I'm not a web guy, so it might be complicated for me, but whoever does your website should be easy to cut and paste and put that HTML video in there to, to make that happen for you. The, all of the, um, the weekly lessons, all of the marketing materials, everything that I mentioned to you, both in Word and PDF, you can download so you have it going forward. You don't have to log on this every time and you can use it on a go forward basis. So once you get your initial kit, there's no need for you to, to have to worry about trying to get anything from BPA of everything you need. You've got your starter kit, you've got your elements for the web online, and you've got all the print files you need to continue with the program. Does that make sense? So one of the big things is understanding what's in the kit and where do I go for the supplies? because we don't want to sell you more supplies. That's not what we do. The only thing, the only thing that's not online, and it won't be, is the secret sauce, okay? Because I know this, look, there's probably some member centers that have logged in and stumbled across 2.0 and said, wow, that's great, I didn't pay any for that. Let me download it and use it. We're not the 2.0 police, we're not gonna come after you. But what you're missing and what you don't have is the secret sauce. There are plenty of programs like this already out there but this is what's missing, the secret sauce. So in the event that you lose your DVD, you'll need to contact us and we'll just initiate another kit. It all comes as one. So those of you that are here today with us at the university, if you already have a kit by chance, you're gonna want this backup DVD, okay? Um, this is the secret sauce. If you misplace this or lose this or something happens to this, you'll just need to contact us and we'll need to get you another kit. But this is not on the, on the website. And at least initially, our intent is not to, to put it on the website because this is the, really the element that, that sets it apart. So that's enough about the program and, and the kit elements. I want to get into the important meat is you know, how do we start up one of these programs and what does it look like? Now, if you've been with us at the university before, if you're here with us this week, this chart should, this graph should look familiar. This is the life cycle of a bowler. And we teach this at the university and a lot of our programming relates to this because every one of us in this room and every one of us watching, we fall somewhere on this life cycle of a bowler. We just, we just do. Um, and, and just as a reminder, I'm just gonna walk through who these people are and the reason is it helps us ask the first question of who's a candidate for 2.0? Who should we be doing this for? And it's one of the areas that when I work with centers that they often stumble upon is understanding who's the real uh, prospect for, for 2.0. So if we, if we kind of roll through here, and I'm actually going to work backwards. In this league space between a new league bowler and an avid league bowler, there are about 2 million people in America that participate in some type of organized league play. Uh, currently there. There's about 1.8 million that are part of the national governing body, uh, certified USBC, and roughly about 200,000 that are participating in the league but just choose not to participate in a certified program. So there's about 2 million people there. In this space of casual to casual frequent, there are 67 million people, and that's external research through Experience Simmons, that's not, not bowling research, 67 million people that bowled last year once in the last 12 months. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is something you should know, and it's just, it's have this in your marketing toolbox, and you should be very proud of. 
bowling is the largest participation sport in America. Okay? Everybody know that? Bowling is the largest participation sport in America. More people bowl than play golf, tennis, soccer. You fill in the blank, it doesn't matter. Now, I love all those other sports. I have some wonderful dear friends that are golf. They're a little snooty, you know, and I just tell them, I say, hey, stand down, man, because we got 67 million people and we kick you every time, okay? More people bowl than do any of those sports. So hold your head high. Be proud of the industry you're a part of, you know, when you're talking about this activity called bowling because the facts are the facts. More people bowl than do any other activity. And, and in most parts of the world, it's the same. There are some areas of the world that uh, some of their unique uh, country sports are a little more popular. But uh, here in America, bowling is number one. 67 million people participate in your activity. Now, before we get all you know, proud of ourselves and patting ourselves on the back, let's understand this. We should be number one. We absolutely should be number one. And the reason for that is twofold. One is we have an uh, incredible sport that has no barriers to entry. And we have an incredible sport that, had, that goes from three to 103. So we're part of a product that, that, that we can market virtually any age group and we can market to virtually any type of group. We don't have limitations based on skill level, based on limitations, based on gender, based on size, based on race, any of those things, right? And think about the groups that come see you, especially some of those special needs groups and different types of groups. Those are, those are the most fantastic groups in the world that come ball. I love seeing those folks. It makes their day makes their week, you know, so I don't care whether you're three or 103 or whatever your limitations are, anybody can bowl. So we should be number one. So be proud of that you're number one, but know that we should be number one in that. Now, why do I say all that? Then when you get down here to non-bowler, when, when I back out people under the age of four and I back out people less than 25,000 in income that probably can't participate in my product and, and pay to, you know, as a for-profit business, I come up with a number of about 200 million people that haven't bowled yet in the last 12 months. Now in, in our country, with our sport, uh, you'll find that there aren't many people in America that have never bowled. What you'll find is many people that are lapsed bowlers. If you visit with someone, you'll often hear them say something to the effect of, well, that was a lot of fun. I hadn't, I didn't, last time I did that, I was in college. Or I haven't done that since the kids were small. Or I haven't done that since we got married. Or I haven't done that since I was in college. Or what, you fill in the blank. You don't meet many people in America that say, well, I've never bowled, what's that, right? Now, I've never played lacrosse. I watched my first lacrosse game last week when I went to visit my daughter in college. I didn't know what was going on. But, you know, I, I, I know people know about bowling. So you, we have a lot of people that are lapsed folks. There's a lot of lapsed bowlers that are in that 200 million. Now, why do I mention all this and what does it mean to bowling 2.0? Because here's where I would tell you, the first question we have to ask is, who should be participated in 2.0? Now, remember, our primary target's adults doesn't mean that other groups are bad that we can't use them but one of the first questions we're going to ask is who should be in this program now your first inclination and all of you are going to do this you're going to want to go after these new league bowlers or these people that are already participate in our, our sport these two million folks and you're going to want to do 2.0 for them no fight the urge don't do it it's a recipe for disaster now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do programs for them or we shouldn't improve their experience or we shouldn't help their skill level, but it's different programming. This is a sampling program that takes non-users, lets them sample our product, and we convert them into users. We do not want to go to our current league base and put them into Bowling 2.0 because they're already bowling with us. Remember, the goal is to generate new league bowlers. I want to take care of those league bowlers, especially those new ones, and I want to help them, but this is not the product to help them. Make sense? So I don't want to go after those folks. For most of you, for most of you watching or most of you here, most, most centers around the, around the country, your first Bowling 2.0 is going to be made up from some of this 67 million. It's these casual folks. And specifically, it, we'd like it to be these casual, not the casual frequent, but these casual folks. You know these folks. They're the folks that come in four times a year, and when they come in, they look lost. They come in for when it rains. They come in for the family outing. They come in once a year for the corporate fundraiser. You know these people. They don't know which fingers to put in the ball. They're the folks that when you tell them they're on lane 12, they reply, where's that? And then we in our great service aspects say right next to 11. 
You know, it's not, it's not that kind. Right? You know these folks. I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the newbies coming in. They are the perfect target for 2.0, the perfect target. And there were, that's where 99% of you will go to start your first group. Because if I can take that, that, that user that's an infrequent user that's struggling and let them sample my product and teach them a little something in that four weeks, I've got a pretty good chance of converting them into some type of a, type of a program. So fight the urge to go after a league bowler, different, different programming. You're going to really start to target these casual bowlers, part of that 67 million and that comes into your facility. And then ultimately, the people that are really starting to hit home runs with this and the people that are really starting, you know, literally hundreds of new uh, league bowlers in their center have figured out how to crack this code. And that's going to the non-bowler, the non-user, and letting them come sample our product. Now, I don't want to get into a political discussion because I learned a long time ago, you don't talk about politics or religion if you want to keep friends. But I know this, in our, in our country today, and often around the world, in our country today, one of the biggest buzzwords there is, is healthcare, is it not? Now, I don't care where you stand on it, that's not the point of the discussion. But as, everywhere you turn, healthcare, 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 health and wellness is a big deal. So what you have here, and what you're gonna have access to, is a four week health and wellness program. That's what this is, it really is. So the folks that have understood how to reach these non-users, and let them sample our product, convert them into users, have understood how to go out in their community and reach out to folks and say, Angie, I've got an incredible health and wellness program for all of your staff, and by the way, I'm willing to give it to you for free, right? So imagine me going to my local Kohl's and going to HR, and Angie's in HR, and telling her, Angie, I've got a four-week Kohl's health and wellness program. I know you want to take great care of your folks. Oh, and by the way, everyone can participate. No one sits the bench. You know, if we have a softball league at Kohl's, can everybody play? If I have a volleyball league at Coles, can everybody play? No. If I do a health and wellness bowling program, can everybody participate? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely can. Now, you've got to take baby steps. You've got to run your first 2.0 with this casual group to become comfortable. Then when you get really good at this, somebody like Alexander or you sales folks, you're going to go out and just start scouring those businesses. Imagine going around to all the businesses in your community that, that have enough mass and saying, I want to do a uh, Best Buy health and wellness program, four weeks, I'm gonna teach all your team members how to bowl. Now what they don't know, what Angie doesn't know at Coles, is on week five, she's gonna start a little Coles bowling club. She just hadn't figured that out yet. So if I went to Angie and said, Angie, would you start, like to start a new Coles bowling league? What are my chances of going from zero to a bowling league with Angie at Coles? Pretty zero, pretty close to, to zero. But if I start out with Angie and say, Angie, I'd like to do a health and wellness program for you and all your staff. It's four weeks and it's free. Everyone can participate. Maybe she gives it a go. And if that group has a good time, maybe enough of them will then participate on week five in my program. So you see where, where we're going with that, okay? So understanding who our prospect is, is critical in this, in this program. This really is bowling's answer to sampling. All of you know sampling right? You know sampling. If you, if you go to a, a, a Costco or a Sam's Club on the weekend, what's at every end of every aisle? Samples. samples. Some sweet old lady giving away samples from the chicken fingers or the cheese curds or whatever it is. Why is she doing that? She wants you to buy them. Absolutely. Now, does everybody that goes by and steals the free cheese curds buy them? No, but enough of them buy that that it makes it worthwhile. My wife and I are perfect examples. My wife, when we go to Costco or Sam's, she feels guilty if she ate the young lady's cheese curds and has to put them, doesn't matter if she wants them or not. I, oh, I sampled the curd, I have to get the, get the basket, just one little basket. I'm like, no, it's free, let's keep going. In fact, let's circle around again and do it some more. <laughs> let's just keep eating and eating. So there are people that will take advantage. My point for that is there are people that will take advantage of your 2.0 like me that will never participate in the Coles uh, you know, bowling club. And that's okay. But for every one of me, there's a sweet person like my bride that will say, wow, that's pretty cool. That was fun. I'll, I'll try that. And they'll throw it in the cart. They'll throw it in the cart. Okay. Now, one of the next questions we have to answer is when should I run the program? Okay. We've identified who our target is, who we want to go after. The question is that I often get is, Bart, when should I run a 2.0 program? And I will fire that back with my question to you. When do you want to start a new league? That's the answer to that question. Because remember, I want these people to start a new bowling club or a league or some type of a frequent activity. So that's where you want to study your day part, your demand, and then you're going to look at that inventory and say, when do I want to start that? 
So I, I, if, if I have inventory Tuesday at 6.30, for example, and I've got eight lanes that I'm trying to fill, and I'd like to start a new league or a club or something social there, then the question is, that's where I'm going to do my, my bowling 2.0. I don't want to do a bowling 2.0 on Saturday at 3 o'clock if that's not when I want to start a new group, right? Why would I want to run it on a Saturday if my goal is to start new league bowling on a Tuesday? So always start your program when you're trying to start that, that new league. Okay. Then the second part of that is what type of program do you want to start? Is it going to be mixed? Is it going to be kids? Is it going to be singles? Whatever that is. So sometimes, you know, if I have a program Tuesday at 630 and I want that to be an adult program, it can be mixed or doesn't matter, but I just want it to be an adult program. Do I want to mix in families in my 2.0 on Tuesday at 630? No, absolutely not because that's not my target who I'm going after. Maybe my families, I want to do Sunday after church at three o'clock. Maybe that's when I want to do my family 2.0. If I decide I want to start a, an adult child league or a family league or a family club on Sunday afternoons. So we start with the end in mind and we work backwards and that tells us when we should start it and who we should go after. I've often seen centers that have been all excited. Bart, I had 30 people at my 2.0, it was so awesome. You know, and we, but we didn't have a big conversion and what happened? So when we fishbone backwards and, and really try to diagnose, do a little post-mortem on what happened, we find out that there was a whole bunch of families and kids, you know, and the families didn't want to be around the young adults that were going to have a beer and a pizza and enjoy themselves. The kids, the young adults that were going to have a beer and a pizza didn't feel comfortable around kids, you know, so it was a mixing of these people that just didn't, didn't mesh. They weren't going to be good together. They weren't going to learn together, and they weren't going to then bowl together and stay together. So I want that affinity of them learning together and then bowling together and then staying together. Make sense? That's what I want them to do. And I can't mix young adults, millennials that are going to have a, a drink and enjoy themselves with a family that has, you know, maybe I don't want any drinking around. And I, you know, I want to have a family atmosphere for them, and I'm going to have a pitcher of Pepsi and a, and a pizza. And both of those are good but together they can, be, they can be detrimental. So we always look at, when do I want to start my new league? What type of league am I going after? That answers the question. And I think it's per perfectly fine to go to a family, if Connie signed up with her family and wanted to do a 2.0 and, and learn how to bowl Tuesday night, I think it's okay to tell her no, but I'd like to tell her no in a positive way so I can get her into something else. I might say to Connie, Connie, that's awesome. I'd love to have your family. The one we're doing on Tuesday at 6.30 is for adults. Probably not good for the kids. There'll be some alcohol and things. But we're going to start next month or the month after or in two weeks. We're going to do a great family program on Sunday afternoons. Can we sign you up for that? Okay. Well, I'm a little disappointed I can't do Tuesday, but I understand. You, you know. So it's okay to say no if you say no the right way. Same, you could flip it. If, if Austin's out with the guys and Austin wants to do Sunday at 3, I'm going to say, Austin, man, so excited you want to do 2.0. But I got to tell you, Sunday's probably not going to be good for you. There's going to be families and a lot of kids and probably not going to be good to, you know, high five and having a beer and a pie. But I'm doing this cool program Tuesday at 630 that's going to start in a month. Why don't we do that one, right? So I want to match the prospect with the right time because you're spending too much energy not to have, have that do a return on investment. Make sense? Okay, let's get into how does it work. So I'm going to say the F word, and then we'll talk about, talk about why. Uh, it's a four-week designed to be a free program. Now let me take a time out and say a little bit about this, because as the uh, project team, this is something that we spent a lot of time on. There are many within our industry that are passionate, passionate about their position of free versus paid, and I can respect all of those, okay? Um, so one thing you'll notice when you go through your materials at home, or you look online and you look at any of the materials, nowhere on here does it say anything about free and nowhere on here does it say anything about paid. So you as the center can make the best business decision for you, whatever that is, okay? We, ha we respect that. I respect that there are some wonderful operators in our country that the free is not in their business model and you know we're not there to judge them or we're not there to make direction for them, we'll support them. So this is, is neutral when it comes to pricing. Now. When we're here together at the university, or I'm out uh, traveling anywhere in the country or around the world teaching to this, we always teach to free, okay? And I'll tell you a little bit about why, and then at the end, you make your own decision. There are some sitting here today that may say, hey, Bart, I appreciate what you said, but I, I got a charge for it. I respect that. There'll be some watching that, that'll say, hey, I, I hear you, but my boss will never go for free. I, we respect that. So you're gonna have to make your own decision. 
Now, I can tell you this, because the data is very clear, and if you think about it, it makes logical sense, that uh, the centers that are choosing to offer this as a marketing program and offer it complimentary, their results are far superior than the ones that are charging. Makes sense, doesn't it? Can you imagine going to Costco and the little, little old lady with the cheese curds saying, that'll be 25 cents, please, you know, to sample the cheese curd. I need, I need a quarter or a nickel. Yeah, it's just not going to go as well, is it? So if I have a center that chooses to offer the program for free versus a center that chooses to offer it for $10 because their business model just says that's what they need to do, makes sense that the free is going to always outperform. Does not mean does not mean that there's not successful bowling centers in America having great results with the program that are charging for it. I, I don't want to mislead. They absolutely are. But when you compare the two, free will always outperform the other there. But ultimately, all of you watching or all of you here are going to make your own choices. Now, let me tell you why I think it, it, we should position it for, for free there in there because I look at this not as a giveaway, I look at this as a marketing cost. If I factor in how much it takes for me to pay for my POS, what my cost is to have a staff member facilitate the program for a couple hours, I look at that no different than it would if I had to buy an ad in the newspaper, or I was gonna buy an ad on cable TV, or I was gonna you know, support the little league team and buy a, a billboard in, in, the, in the field, or whatever that is. This is a marketing cost for me. So I add up that marketing cost, and whatever that is, I need to get a good return on that investment. And if my, my investment isn't greater than my, my, my return isn't greater than my investment, then I probably need to look at if I'm doing it the right way. So this is not a giveaway program just to have free. This is for me, when you think about revenue management, the right product to the right person at the right price, I like using this as a sampling program only if I'm gonna start something new on week five. If you're not gonna start a program on week five, then don't give it away. Charge for it, call it what it is, it's lessons and that's not a bad thing. There are pro shop operators and there are people around the country that offer lessons and charge for it. Nothing wrong with that at all. But this is a marketing program to let people sample our product, to get them into a frequent program, hopefully into to a league there. So I'll, I'll get off of the free wagon. We'll, we'll teach to free today and then you as an operator or a person responsible, you make your own decision. Each week is designed to be an hour and a half, 90 minutes. It's designed to be 30 minutes in the classroom and an hour on the lanes. Let me speak briefly about this. Um, our research, when we did our pilot programs, the new students, those people coming into this program, they felt very strongly and really enjoyed the classroom atmosphere, okay? And look, I understand that all of your physical plants are laid out differently. Uh, sometimes that classroom is a bar. Sometimes it's a meeting room. Sometimes it's an old playroom. Um, but I would tell you to fight the urge of just doing it down on the lane. Someone that's a coach, and again, I love coaches, if you have the heart of a coach, you're gonna to go to the counter and tell them, put this in the video, put this on the lanes and I'll just sit them down in the bowlers area and we'll watch it and I wanna get them started bowling. That's, that's what a coach will want to do because they have the heart of a coach they wanna teach. I'm a business operator. I want you to come see me and then I want you to come see me more on week five and start paying. So I know that that experience for you is greater if I can have some type of a classroom. So whatever that classroom is, Make, make it yours, okay? Because all you really need is, is a, a DVD player or a, uh, a laptop or something to show on a TV to show the video on the, on the screen there, okay? So don't take the shortcut on the classroom, it's important. Each of the lessons, I mentioned there are four lessons, each of the lessons are about 12 to 15 minutes. That's where the experts teach. And then it's followed then by a brief discussion by you as the facilitator, or what I will do as a facilitator in just a moment, to uh, then reinforce what the professionals did. Then we go out on the lanes and we put it into practice, okay? So I know that some of you have limitations on that room. Find that room as best you can. It'll, it'll, you're, I can promise you that your conversion will be much, much better on that. Now, a traditional league bowler that's there for lessons, they don't want to sit in a classroom. They want to go bowl. Their experience is judged on how much they bowl. But if I'm new to the game, I, I want to learn. I, I, I'm okay sitting in the classroom. I'm okay watching the video. I'm okay, you know, having the handout. Those are all things that are important to me, and our, and our research showed that. Um, 90 minutes. Here's another, uh, you know, coaching tip, if you will. Someone with the heart of a coach is going to say, Bart, 90 minutes isn't enough. They want to bowl. You know, I, I don't want to cheat them. I want to let them, I want to let them bowl more. I want to do two hours. No. No. As a business operator, I want them wanting more. I want them to have 90 minutes and have a great experience. And then if they do have a great experience, what may happen? What may they do during the week? Practice. And then guess what? Unlike our league bowlers, guess what happens? They pay. 
They pay. Imagine, imagine a novel idea. People will come and pay for casual bowl, open bowling and not have a coupon. So if you get these people fired up about bowling, they will come back and practice. And you know them. You can spot them a mile away because they're lost and they're new. And, they're, there's, you know, and that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. So th there was some research and methodology behind an hour on the lanes, 30 minutes in a classroom, and capping it at 90 minutes. There was, so, there was just, I mean, in a very condensed time, I'm sharing with you a project over a year and a half that, that we did the research to show that 90 minutes is, is the right time for us to do this. But I love the coaches. The coach is going to say, I want to give them more. And I, I appreciate that. If they're paying you for a lesson, get them out on the lanes right away and give them every, every bit of that and give them a little bit more if you want to. But when I'm taking non-users, letting them sample my product and converting them into users, I want to follow this methodology. Okay. If you're not doing this yourself, when you get back to your center and you give it to a coach, it's one of the first things they're going to tell you. They're going to ask you to say, you know, hey, Savan, uh, I don't really need the classroom thing, man. I want to get them down the lanes. And oh, by the way, we don't have anything after this. You don't mind if I do two hours, do you? Because, you know, I really want to give them their money's worth and give them a good value or, or you know, and the answer to that is no and no. You know, we've got to stay firm to the program because it, it, it works in this methodology for this particular program. And then week five is where we start the rollover. And we'll talk briefly about the rollover, but for most of you, you don't need help with the rollover. You've got all kinds of programs. This is really a feeder program into your new leagues or your developmental programs. What the industry has needed is an ability to take that non-user, let them sample the product and get them into that feeder program. You know, you don't need a new league idea from us. You've got a hundred of them. What you need is new people, you know, where, because the question comes up, where do I find new league bowlers? Where do I get them? Well, you have to nurture them. You have, you have to build them. You have to, to let them experience the product and then let them sample it. Let them, let them try that cheese curd, let them try that wing and then get them, get them hooked on it where they'll come, and, they'll come and do it again. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take all of you at home and I'm gonna take all of you here at the university. We are going to uh, go through lesson one together. I'm gonna show you the uh, lesson. It's, this le first one is a couple minutes longer. It's about 14 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll talk about it for a few minutes. Of course, we're not actually going to go out in the lanes today for sake of time, and in fact, here. But I want you to experience it from uh, a new user standpoint. So all of you are my class. I'm the facilitator. You know, I'm not a pro bowler. I'm not a great coach, but I'm fairly good with people. And I know enough about the basic elements of bowling that I would be comfortable facilitating this, this program with you. Now, what I would like you to do, those of you that are here with us on site at the university, is I want you to look at this with a critical eye. Here's, here's kind of your assignment for the next 14 minutes. I want you to try to look at this through the lens of a new bowler if you can. I know some of you are avid bowlers, but look at this through the lens of a new bowler. But I also want you to tell me when we're done, we'll have a brief discussion. What did you like about the video and what didn't you like about the video? OK, I, I want you to tell me what you didn't like about it. That's OK. You're not going to hurt my feelings. So let's talk about things that you're like, I don't know about that, Bart. Or, yeah, I really like that. OK, so I want you to look through that new lens of a new bowler. And then those of you that are here, we're going to we're going to do a little debrief. And I want you to tell me what you like and didn't like. Make, make some notes there for me. OK. Hello and welcome to Bowling 2.0, where better bowling is only four weeks away. I'm Bart Berger with the Bowling Proprietors Association of America. Welcome. Regardless if you're a new bowler, haven't been bowling for some time, or an occasional bowler just wanting to learn the basics and improve your game, you're in the right spot. You're about to join the bowling movement and be part of America's largest participation sport. That's right, over 70 million Americans bowl each year, making bowling the largest participation sport in the United States. We're here at the International Bowling Campus in Arlington, Texas, inside the ITRC, the International Training and Research Center, where members of our coaching staff will be joining you each week along with the coach at your participating bowling center to share with you everything you need to know about making bowling a lifetime sport. Joining us today to get things started is Carolyn Doran Ballard, who's truly one of the best female bowlers of all time. She's won 22 professional titles, been named Bowler of the Decade, and is a USBC Hall of Fame member. Welcome, Carolyn. Thanks, Bart. Hey, we are ready to rock and roll. Bowlers, let me tell you what you're going to learn over the next four weeks. Besides having fun, you're going to learn the fundamentals of bowling. You're going to learn how to make those spares, you know, the pins that you always leave and you don't know where to stand to make them. You're going to learn about how to have a loose arm swing so that you strike more often. And you're going to learn about bowling etiquette and even how to get your own equipment if you feel you want to get your own ball and your own shoes. We are ready to have you have a lot of fun out there on the lanes. 
Excellent. Thank you, Carolyn. You're in great hands with Carolyn and the coaching team here. You're also in great hands with the coach at your local bowling center. So, hey, let's get started. And remember, most importantly, let's have some fun. Before you get started getting on the approach and rolling your ball down the lane, you're going to have to go to the control downer or the front desk and get a pair of rental shoes. Just want to give you a little bit of a safety tip. These shoes, this part here, needs to stay dry. You don't want any powder, you don't want this part getting wet, because what that does is it does not allow the shoe to slide on the approach and allow you to perform your approach and get good leverage into the line. So be careful when you're in the, in the bowler's settee area and make sure that there aren't any drinks on the floor or any powder that can get on the shoe and inhibit your approach. Before we get you out on the approach and on that lane to throw the ball, we're going to learn a little bit about where to line up and what these markings are on the approach and on the lane and how they can help you be a better bowler and enjoy the sport. There are two sets of dots on the approach. These dots are used for when you're trying to line up to hit the head pin, which is also referred to as the pocket. You might be standing in the middle of the lane. You may have to move a little to the right. You may have to move a little to the left. Using these dots on the approach will help you remember where your strike target is and where your spare shot is. As we move up the approach, there's another set of dots right in front of the foul line. These dots are also used for getting lined up and for targeting purposes. Now, one important factor, this foul line. Do not cross over the foul line. That nasty buzz means you're going to get zero for the frame. Not only that, you don't want to cross the foul line because remember, there's conditioner on the lanes and you don't want to slip. We have stripped this lane so that I can show you how to target and what is on the lane that you can look at. As we go down the lane, there's another set of dots that people use for targeting for both your strike shot and your spare shooting. As we get further down the lane, there's a set of arrows, which is almost to the middle part of this lane that's pretty far down there. So usually the dots or the arrows is where most people target to make it easy for them to see. If you want to target further down the lane, we have range finders way down here. And you can also use this for your strike or your spare shot. Now, one of the other keys you can use, especially since you are a new bowler, is a lot of people like to look at the pins when they're trying to knock them down. This is okay too. Targeting is a personal preference and we have just given you a lot of options. Hi everyone, my name is Herman Glenn. I'm the Director of Equipment Specifications and Certifications here at USBC. Today I'd like to show you some of the different types of lane material you'll be bowling on. First off, we have wood. This is the oldest surface in what some centers still have today. It's the softest and gives you the most curve to your ball. As time went on with maintenance issues and the lane started wearing out, they went to lane shield, which actually was applied to this surface. And after that comes the synthetic lanes, which you'll see more today in most of the centers that you go to. Now that we're inside the bowling center and getting ready to bowl, we have to find a ball that fits us. Sometimes they're a little too heavy, sometimes they're a little light, and the finger holes and thumb hole really never fit. What do these bowling balls do for us? These bowling balls are house balls. They're designed just to be recreational play. They're plastic bowling balls. They're going to go straight down the lane. They're not going to react like the, the high-end performance stuff you may see. The, the holes are important to understand that they basically just plug in a basic fit, a small, a medium, and a large size. So you don't get a custom fit that may be a little too big, like you mentioned, maybe a little too small, but ultimately you want to find one that's close and comfortable just so that you can get the ball off your hand comfortably. Well, we have a few tips that'll help you pick out a ball that's comfortable for you to use. Okay, you've got your lane, and it's time to choose the correct bowling ball. Two important things to remember here. Number one, you want to make sure you get a bowling ball that's approximately 10% of your body weight to begin with. So if you're 100 pounds, a 10 pound ball. If you're 140 pounds, a 14 pound ball. The center is going to have multiple choices for you to choose from. The second thing is the importance of the fit. When you put your hand inside the bowling ball, you want to make sure the fingers fit comfortably. Not too big and not too small so that you can hold on to the ball, but just in that comfortable position so it's easy for you to release the ball when you're going through your approach. How do you place your hand in the ball? I'm going to show you the proper way to do it. If you're using a house ball, 
You want to make sure you pick it up from the sides. What we're going to do today is we're going to place our fingers into the second joint and then roll the ball onto our thumb all the way so it sits all the way onto your thumb. This is a good way to grip a house ball or a conventional fit. If you have your own custom bowling ball, you might be able to go up and wait because it's going to be a perfect fit for your hand. This is a fingertip grip. This time only my fingertips are going to go in first to the first joint and then I'm going to roll it all the way onto my thumb. This helps if you want to learn how to hook the ball. You've got a lot of information on bowling balls. We're going to review the two kinds of bowling balls that you possibly can use to make your bowling experience fun. The house ball, the ball that you're going to have in the bowling center when you're getting ready for competition or just going to have fun with your friends or to bowl league. This is a plastic bowling ball or a polyester bowling ball. It's not going to hook very much. It's going to go really straight and the majority of the time this is drilled with a conventional grip. That's what also helps this ball go straight down the lane. The other bowling ball is one that you may get after week four. This ball here is a reactive bowling ball. This is what's going to give you a little bit more hook or curve into that head pin. This one is going to be drilled for your hand, custom fit. And this is the one that's going to allow you to get to the next level of bowling. Choosing that right ball can be a little difficult, but I'm going to give you one more little tip to try and make it a little more comfortable. For that house ball, pick up a lighter weight first, say 10 pounds, 10% 10 of your body weight. So if you're 100 pounds, it would be a 10 pound ball. And just put your elbow next to your side and hold that ball in your palm. If the ball doesn't move and it's steady, that weight is perfect for you. If it moves around a little bit and you feel that where you have to grab it, it's a little bit too heavy, go down in weight. Same thing for when you're getting that personally fitted ball. They will hold that ball in your hand to see if that weight is right for you. I know we're all here to bowl and roll the ball down the lane, but there's so much more to the sport of bowling. It's a sport, and in any sport, you have to keep yourself in shape and make sure you do the right things so that you don't get injured. What are some of the things we can do in bowling before we start to get out there? Well, it's very important because bowling is an athletic activity. You gotta make sure when you're warming up, and we've learned that you need to do dynamic warm up. Dynamic warm up simply gets the body's core warmed up and gets the blood flowing to the larger muscle groups because we're going to compete with those large muscle groups, the leg muscles, the arm muscles. So we do dynamic warm ups to begin with and then we get on the approach and, and start to bowl. So I don't want you to be embarrassed but really the bowlers area, the settee area is a great place to do a few of those before you get out there for your competition, correct? Correct. It's the right place to do it. It's right before competition. It's right when you're getting ready to, to compete or, or recreationally play. It's the right place to do it. And like any other sport, you do it right before you get ready to play. So the bowler circle is definitely the place to go compete, go warm up. Okay, here's some examples of what we can do to warm up before we bowl. Arm circles are very simple to do. We start going forward, we simply roll at the shoulders and get our arms going forward and then we go the opposite direction, we go backward. One other exercise are torso twists. With our hands in by our side, we basically just bend at the torso, back and forth. We can also do leg swings. Standing on one leg, we swing the opposite leg back and forth. We make sure and do this to both sides on each of the exercises. One of the things that also gets the body real warmed up is to do running in place. When starting your approach in bowling, the stance, your start, is the most important and you need to be comfortable. What are some of the key components, Coach Steven, to help with a good stance? Well, there's two things that are really important when it comes to the stance. Number one is balance. From the shoulders to the knees, everything being balanced over the top of the footwork in relationship to where you're holding the ball is going to be essential when it comes to starting a good approach. To go along with that is going to be posture. Making sure your posture stays the same from your start position all the way through to your finished position is very important when it comes to balancing your approach. So these key components in your start will lead you to a good finish. Every bowler is going to be a little different in finding their starting position on the approach. Teresa is going to begin by showing us how to find the appropriate start position for a basic four-step approach. She's going to walk to the foul line, place her heels on the set of dots, and she's simply going to take four and a half steps back from the foul line and once she takes her half step she'll pivot on her toe 
And this will be her approximate starting distance from the foul line. Because everybody's a little different size, everyone's going to start in a little different position on the approach. So it's important to make sure you understand where your starting position is. Go to the foul line, set of dots, four and a half steps back, pivot on that last step, turn around, and that's going to be your approximate distance to start for your beginning position on the approach. Okay, let's start with the foundation, the four-step approach. This is the basic thing you want to know when you're getting into learning how to get the ball off your hand comfortably from start to finish. Teresa is going to help demonstrate for us. She's found a starting position that's comfortable from the foul line. She's going to begin with her balance over her feet. Her knees are slightly bent and the ball will be placed in front of her body so that she's balanced and ready to perform her shot. Her first step is going to have the bowling ball and the ball side foot move at the same time. They're going to move out at the same position. Her second step is going to be the non-ball side foot where the ball comes down by her side. The third step of her approach will have the top of her backswing and now the fourth step will be her slide and when she releases her non-ball side foot will be behind her and come behind so that it's balanced at the bottom of her, her release. It's important to be stable and have a good foundation when you finish your shot. A four step approach will really add pins to your game. We've just learned about the four-step approach. Let's take a quick recap and understand those steps again and understand some places we may want to be careful of when we're talking about it. In the four-step approach, the first place is the stance and our balance. We want to make sure that when we start, we've got everything comfortably over our footwork. In our start position, when we move our ball side and the ball side foot at the same time for step number one, we want to make sure that that's a smooth, rounded position. We don't want to lock our arms straight out in front of us. We don't want the ball to fall too fast. We want a nice, smooth, rounded position going into that swing. Through steps two and three, we need to remember that the ball swings freely from our ball side shoulder. It swings from our shoulder nice and loose, and we try to keep a free arm swing throughout the approach. Now the finished position is where the big key is. We want to really nail that position and make sure we're solid. So when we get to the finished position, we make sure that we follow through all the way to our tar through our target and toward our pins. We make sure our opposite arm has good balance for our body positioning. And we make sure that once we follow through, we finish the shot with our elbow all the way over our shoulder. That's going to make sure we extend our follow through all the way toward those targets and those pins. So, take your game to the next level, take the four-step approach, and make it part of your game. Okay, it's important to look both directions when you're getting onto your approach for lane courtesy. It's very important to be safe in this environment and know that there's no one on your left and no one on your right when you step up to take your approach. Once you've stepped into your starting position and you're ready to go, you'll throw your shot. Remember to follow through toward your target and make sure that you hold your that balance position so that you're comfortable and you execute a good shot. You've got some information about the game in regards to safety. We've talked about where to start on the approach. We've talked about the four-step approach. For any further questions about what you've learned, check your reference guide. Okay, so that is uh, lesson one. What I'd like to do then is we'll move on to there just for a second. We'll freeze that. So this would be the point in the program, of that lesson, where I would come and I would then have my 10, 15 minute discussion about the elements in there of the lesson. And then we'd go out on the lanes and we'd put it into practice. And then you as the student would then have this as your takeaway that you could be uh, ref referencing to while you're participating in bowling and then also take home with you, you know, as kind of your, your takeaway. So if any of you come from an educational background or you have family members in an education, you think about that learning model of telling, showing, letting them try, praising and redirecting. It's it got a pretty good educational focus there. And that's why the, the lesson plan is so important in, in going through there. Now, I'd like to stop and do a bit of a sidebar just for a couple of minutes while we have a, a few minutes together. And for those of us that are with us here at the university, let's talk a little bit. I want to get your feedback about um, what did you like or what didn't you like about it? And I'm fine with either of those. Let's, let's talk those and get those out on, on, on the table there. Throw it out there, Kim. Right, so, so Kim mentioned that uh, you liked it because they talked about the basics, but that you didn't feel like they were talking down to you. That, that's why you knew some of that. It was informational and you didn't feel intimidated, but you didn't feel spoken down to. Right. Good, all right, thank you for sharing that. Any, anyone else, what did you like, what didn't you like? Okay, so Alexander liked the safety, you liked the fundamentals, good, all right, what else? Yeah, 
Yeah. So, Chris, thank you for adding. Chris liked the, the four-step approach. It's basic. It's elementary. You can teach that. And, and what I think is, you know, if I was going to myself, I don't know that I'm skilled enough or I have enough confidence to teach a four-step approach without the aid, with the aid of the video. But letting the professionals, Stephen and Carolyn, do what they do and me reinforce what it is they're teaching, it gives me a different comfort level to say, you know what, to a brand new person, I can teach them that four-step approach. Okay? Remember, we're not talking about taking an existing league bowler and trying to teach them the bowl better. I have no business doing that. We're talking about taking a non-user, and infrequent user, teaching the basic four steps. And I, I, you know, all of you should feel comfortable enough to be able to do that because it's more about your personality and how you relate to people than it is having all the technical knowledge at, the, at this stage of the game there. So you guys are being kind. What didn't you like? There's got to be some stuff you didn't like. What, what did you look at and just kind of say, I don't know? Okay. How you, how you should start bowling with shoes and their bowling ball that you can choose. Yeah. Choose the ball. Yeah, and, and, and that, uh, I need like the, the, you know, when new people come in, you ever watch a new person come in for the first time and tries to choose a bowling ball? It, it's kind of, it's an awkward thing for them, isn't it? And it's even more painful to watch, you know, when you're watching that versus, so it's the simple things. It's the simple thing. So I feel strong enough about my bowling ability and my people skills to help somebody find a ball, but I should have no business discussing with them. Is it, you know, a reactive resin or, you know, the weight block? And, you know, that's way beyond my, my skill level to do that. I shouldn't be having those conversations. But what, what, what didn't you like? There's got to be some things that he didn't like. You're being, you're being nice. Well, Chris's question was, are you only going to have the fifth? We don't tell them anything about what we're going to do on week five until we get to week four, right? So the first three weeks, we're just teaching them about bowling. Now, you as the operator can decide when you want to layer that in. And I'm going to come back to that when we get to the end. So let's put that in the parking lot just for, for a minute there. All right, so I, I'm going to tell you a couple of things that I don't like about it. Because uh, as, as, as good as it is, you know, it has a lot of things in there. And there's some things that if, if it was Bart's Family Fun Center, I might not include into the, to the video. But it's not Bart's Family Fun Center. It's the International Bowling Campus. And it's a collaborative effort by a lot of great people. So uh, I don't know if you caught the part in there about the, um, the picking the bowling ball and the 10% of your body weight. I'm thinking, mm, where's the 19-pound ball, you know? So that one, I'm thinking, that may not apply to adults. And again, when you have a collaboration of a team and you have a lot of people, you, you, you know, it, it's a team effort and you don't always get all your individual ways. So there are some things in there that I scratch my head at. So uh, I don't care about, the 10% thing I think is great for youth. I think it doesn't apply to adults. Because how do you tell a grown man that, you know, when he's asking about where the 20 pound ball is? And you're like, well, it only goes to 16. <laughs> Right? How about, I've had some comments over the time we've introduced this. Did anybody notice or have any opinions one way or the other about the music, the background music? That's what I was going to say. It makes me angry. Makes you, okay. <laughs> that the entire time, I felt like I was being rushed. Okay, so you didn't care for the music. Right. I've had some traditions. We were launching this at our industry gathering summit. I'll never forget. I was before the, the top 10% of the industry launching this product that we worked on for, for a year and uh, got done and showed this lesson just like this. And the room went silent and a hand went up from one of the most well-respected people in the industry that remained nameless and said, Bart, I hate the music. <laughs> and for that moment, I thought, what are you going to say, Bart? And, and just in, in true fashion, being the, the, you know, great thinker that I am, I said, good, we didn't make it for you. <laughs> and, and, my, and he stopped for a second, and I thought, well, that could have been career ending. And he said, you're right, I love it. And his point was, as, uh, you know, as a person that maybe was a little bit older, the whole idea of the, of the multi-sensory and the multi-level and the music and all the swooshing and things going was a bit overwhelming. But for millennials and other folks, they're like, what's the big deal? I didn't even catch it. I mean, you know, those of us that have, have daughters or kids, teenage, I have a teenage daughter that can be doing, playing on the phone, uh, typing on the computer, watching TV and listening to music at the same time. And if I walk by and turn off the TV, she's like, dad, dad, what are you doing? I'm like, you can't be watching that. Oh yeah, I am. I'm like, well, what's happening then? And she'll recite what happened because she really is doing five things at once. Where for me, that, you know, I'm used to doing things in a linear fashion, one thing at one time. 
So, uh, you know, remember that this is being built for today's guest, not necessarily yesterday's, you know, lead bowler. And not that one is good or bad. It's just that's the difference. So for me, I'm like you with the music. And if you notice, we did a little what I call vignettes, little swooshes in and out, which, uh, again, for somebody that grew up in America as a linear learner from A to, a to Z and there's no inter intermission or no break, that can be very, um, very discomforting. But for uh, today's learner, you know, that it's just like in and out, short little swooshes, little quick vignettes, teach, teach something to move on it becomes very paced. So there was some methodology be behind that, okay? What about the, uh, nobody said anything about the exercising. Yeah, come on, Daniel. Daniel's like, all right, dude, I don't know about the exercising. Yeah, so if I went to, da if Daniel, if I went to your center back to Michigan and said, hey, everybody, Tuesday night, league bowlers, let's get up on the approach. We're going to do some calisthenics. What, what, would, the, what would the league bowlers do? They would laugh. They would laugh, and some guy in the end would say, Bart, here's my calisthenic, 12 ounces at a time. Keep them coming. That's how I loosen up, right? It, it, they absolutely wouldn't do it. But if I went to a new group of non-users and said, hey, gang, everybody, let's get on the approach. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to loosen up to make sure nobody gets hurt. What would we do? Every one of you would do it. You absolutely, every one of you would do it. Now, I'm not a golfer. If I took a golfing lesson and the golf person said, hey, Bart, come on up here. Here's what we're going to do before we play golf. We loosen up. And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know. Now, maybe it's the dumbest thing ever. No one does it. But if he tells me or she tells me that's what I'm going to do, then guess what I'm going to do? Now, I will tell you that as part of the uh, quick story, as part of the, 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 the process back and forth, we had a lot of people in this, in this kitchen cooking this up. Um, the coaching people pushed back hard with me on this. And, and I'm glad they did because I was wrong. And they said, Bart, do you want to be a sport or not? If you're going to be a sport, then act like a sport, treat it like a sport, and, and do calisthenics like a sport. And, and you know what? They were right. And, I, and I, they pushed back, and I said, you know what? You're right. We're leaving that in there. Because that was one of those things that I'm like, yeah, I'm like, uh, no one's going to do that. That's the goofiest thing ever. I had the chance to drive by and stop by a center and watch the NCAA finals for the women bowling uh, before it started. Every team, before they started bowling, was doing calisthenics and loosening up as they should. And, and really, it was just kind of a thing to remind me that, you know, that's the great thing about synergy and getting the team together and getting those different thoughts. And it really resonated for me. I, I have a daughter. My youngest daughter is a softball player. She plays competitively in, in college. And I thought about what would happen if she ever chose not to loosen up before a game and what would happen to her. Um, and and um, I know this, the coach would sit her on the bench, that if she disrespected the game that much and didn't care enough about her team that she put herself in a position to get injured, she wouldn't be playing. And so the coaching group in that case, they pushed back on us, the operators, and they were spot on right. So there's a lot of things in here. So for those of you that are, are watching and those of you that are here, let me say this. There are way too many things in here for you to go through all of them. And when you watch this, when you, whether you go back to your center and watch it again or whether you're watching it online, there are going to be some things in here that you philosophically may just say, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't believe in that 10% rule or I'm not comfortable with, with this method. That's okay. I tell folks, don't speak to it. Because if you're brand new, you're not going to be able to absorb everything in the video. This is the part where I, as the instructor, the facilitator, pull out the things that I think are important and teach to those and don't mention anything about the things I don't necessarily agree with or don't want to teach to. So in my example, when I facilitate this class with all of you, I would never, ever, ever mention the 10% rule. It just would never come up. I would have a different method. I like the method Carolyn showed with putting the ball on your side for choosing a ball and choosing the weight. I would never speak 10%. Now, if somebody in the class, if Kimberly said, well, uh, excuse me, what about that 10%? I would speak to that and just say, you know, Kim, that's a great method for kids. We don't use that for adults. Here's what we're going to do tonight for us. Here's how we're going to choose a ball. And I would have an answer for that. So I think that's where you can customize the program for you and make sure you're comfortable with it, right? So you can pull out the things you think are important, and then you can just not speak to the things that you say, well, I'm not real sure about that. I don't know that I want to, want to speak to that. Make sense? And you can have that same methodology with each of the lessons. There's too much in there for the new person to, to really digest. You then speak to. So for me, this is where I would come back to you. I'd pull out the six, eight, seven things that I think are important for us that I want to talk to about. And then we're going to go out in the lanes and we're going to put it into practice. Now, let's think about lesson one. When we go out there for an hour and we're going to choose a bowling ball, we're going to find our starting spot. We're going to do a lot of stuff without even bowling. How much real bowling am I going to get in in week one? Not much. 
Not much. So again, to the league bowler, if they're participating in this and they and their experience and they get not much, they're going to say, "Boy, this was a ripoff. This did, this wasn't much fun." But for a new person that's learning about the game, learning the safety rules, learning about the balls and the shoes and all the things that go with it, it's going to be part of their complete experience. And they don't judge the experience with you off of the number of frames they throw. They're judging off what am I learning? Am I learning about this activity? Did I learn where to stand? Did I learn how to find a, a ball? Did I learn about safety in my shoes? All those things are important to them. That's why this guest and the experience of this person is so, so different than with somebody that's already with you, okay? I believe that any one of us in this room or any one of, uh, of us watching, that if you have some basic knowledge of this game and you've got a good personality, you can go out and facilitate this, right? Because think about who you're, you're teaching to. It changes the whole game. It changes everything. So I promise you, Connie, with a little bit of work, I don't know where you stand in, you, in your bowling career, if you bowl at all, I promise you, you could go out and start new people. You would get enough of comfort level to take a non-user and do that. In fact, I will tell you, new folks that are new to bowling sometimes make the best coaches in this because they've gone through that. They, they've just figured out their four-step approach. They've just figured out how to select the right ball. They're teaching along with them. You're not teaching somebody that is bowling with you for 35 weeks that, you know, you're trying to read lanes and those type of things, okay? So that's the methodology of the lesson that we go out. Real quickly, I'll just share with you a couple of things that happened in the other uh, lessons. In week two, we talk about posture, feet alignment, arm swing, pins, targeting, cool down. We recommend that in week one and week two that you not keep score, okay? Just don't turn the overheads on, just turn the pin setters on and just let them have fun. Just let them, let, because don't let them get caught up in looking at the score. And the, the other reason for that is, I'll go back to my golf analogy, would I ever want to keep score in golf in t unless I've learned how to putt? I wouldn't, would I? It'd be pretty miserable. Now in our space, what haven't we taught them how to do yet? Shoot a spare. Alexander, absolutely shoot a spare. So I don't want someone to get, get discouraged in the first two weeks. Because remember, in week one, they're not bowling a lot. Week two, they're coming back and they're putting that into practice. I want them knocking down pins, knowing where they start, having that four-step approach. And I don't want them caught up in that score and getting, getting sidetracked with, what do I do with this spare? So I don't, that's why until we teach them how to shoot a spare, I don't want to keep score. Until I learn how to putt, why would I want to keep score in golf? Now, in week three, because sooner or later we want to keep score, otherwise there's no fun. In week three is where we teach the 369 spare system. We go through these other things, and now we're going to keep score because people want to get measured. They want to get better. So we'll, we'll start keeping score there, okay? Week four, we go through some bowling terminology. We talk about scorekeeping. We talk about if you're interested in getting your own equipment. We talk about putting it all together. And Chris, in the end of the video, I pop back on there and even, I even say, hey, you know, you've got a great program starting next week at your center. Make sure you ask about, you know, what it is or something to that effect because we want them coming back in week five. Now, you might want to start talking to them about that in week three. You may want to wait till week four. That's in, you may want to start at week two. That's where you customize it for you. But as that Coles group's coming together and they're learning together and they're bowling together, I want them then rolling over into some type of a program together. Okay, uh, and doing that. Let me s make one more comment about the coaching uh, style and then I'll wrap up with uh, kind of week five and, and, and the rollover. And that is I often get asked the question, what's the uh, coaching style during the, the time on the lanes that, that you find most productive or that you've seen work the best? And I'll share with you kind of the, 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 the way that, that I've seen it really net good results. Not the only way, doesn't mean it has to be your way, but if you ask the question, what's, what's the, the way would you recommend, this is the way I, I, would, I would certainly teach to and certainly recommend to. And that is that um, you have one lead instructor that is facilitating the group as a whole, and then I have one person helping on the lanes, one for every four lanes. You know, Because if you think about it, if you're going to try to give little quick tips and pointers, can I really do more than four lanes? I can't be any value. It just, it kills me when, I, when I'm a center and they're, they got 32 people in their 2.0 and they got one coach. If you're one coach for 32 people, how much time are you really gonna spend with someone? None, you're a babysitter. Can you really give anybody one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one time? Now, it's an investment, I get that. It's a, it's a couple hours of payroll, it's an investment if you do that. So let's say that I've got uh, eight lanes going, I've got 32 people in my 2.0, which is a pretty good class. I'm gonna have one instructor on a 
set of four lanes. I'm going to have another instructor on a set of four lanes. And then as the lead instructor, I'm going to be walking people through the exercises. And I want us to learn together and I want us to grow together because I want us to bowl together. So what I would do in that case is if you're my class on lane one, one, two, three, and four, I'm going to say, all the ones, let's get up. We're going to find our starting spot. And we'll walk over to the approach, all the ones out here. Remember, we're going to do one, two, three, four and a half and turn. Mark your spot. So we're doing that all together. And then if somebody is struggling a little bit or someone needs a little quick tip, my person that's down on that, that pair of lanes, those two pair of lanes, they can run over and help Angie or they can run over and give a, a little, little, you know, something to, to cue. They're my, they're my helpers, if you will. They're the person that is it's as much about positive acknowledgement, you know, giving them a high five as it is making sure that they stop there. Okay, all the twos, twos, let's get up there. Let's find our starting spot. We walk through that together. All the threes. All the fours. So we're doing this together for the first couple of weeks as we're learning where our spot is, we're learning how to, where to stand, learning how to throw the ball. So we're learning together as a group because ultimately it may not be a group that works together, but I want them to learn together and grow together because I want them to, to bowl together in week five to keep, keep growing. So I, it's not the only way, it's not the absolute way, but I love doing it that way because we're doing this as a group versus me having one person over here and another person, what are they doing over there? They're doing something different we're doing. What, why aren't we doing that? How, how come they, they must be learning something different? And then if I'm one of the people that is not on the lane, I have my resource guide that I can be looking at saying, okay, okay, got that. All right, I need to move here. So I've got this kind of as my, my resource guide. We're working with folks and you've got enough people out on the lanes that you can help them and, and do that. Does it make sense? So I find that to be the best model for working together. Again, depends on what your, your constraints are and what you have. And again, even within that model, it takes a different person to be the lead facilitator than it does for someone just to be on the lanes, encouraging people, giving a high five and giving them a little tip if they need it, right? That's a different, that's a different person. You know, I might have a, a super outgoing, friendly person that is my lead instructor and my other people are down there just giving kind of quick tips and high fives and starting them off. Remember, you're dealing with somebody that doesn't know what fingers go in the ball. You're dealing with someone that has no idea where to stand. You're dealing with someone that has no idea what's on the other side of that foul line. So it's, it's, a, new, it's a new person there. Then week five is where we make the register ring. This is where we take that group and we convert them into some type of a program. Now I, for a placeholder, have just put down this eight for eight, just as a discussion point. Most people across the country have heard for the eight for eight program. Uh, some do nine for nine, 10 for 10, 12 for 12. I wish we could do a 35 for 35, okay? You know, that would be very cool. But I know in today's environment that does, doesn't happen. So this is where you, as the center, decide what you wanna put those people into on week five. And, and you folks nail this, you already know what to do. I will just tell you this, the uh, data shows, and if you think about this too, it also makes logical sense, the data shows that the smaller the time commitment, the more people I'll get to convert on week five. If I ask all of you, if you're all in my class, and I ask you to join a 16-week program, and then I ask a similar group to join a 12-week program, where am I gonna get better success? Absolutely, that's just human nature, okay? So what I tell folks is, make it fun, make it as short as possible, as long as you're comfortable with your business model, okay, and what you need to charge. You may not be able to do an eight for eight. That may not be a model that you can, you can subscribe to. It may need to be a 10 for 10. It doesn't matter to me. Do something, make it fun, make it short, know that the shorter it is, the more conversion you'll have. And then ultimately, I'd like to roll them into something that's longer term. There are some centers in America that have been doing this enough now that they have groups that just keep rolling over, rolling over, rolling over. And, and before they know it, they bowl 24 weeks. But if you ask them, would you like to sign up for 24 weeks? They absolutely say no. People in Justin's era that millennials that are growing up do not commit to anything for 24 weeks. They don't commit to things much more than four weeks. Four weeks is a stretch, right? Because that's just, it's the lifestyle. So you, you've, you've got you've to know that. So the shorter, the better. But this is the part that, that you don't need the help with us. You've got, you've got the program on there. And then ultimately, I, I want to get them into, I'd love for them one day to bowl in a USBC certified program that goes 24, 28, 32 weeks. But I've got to grow them and nurture them along that, that bowler's life cycle, okay? Do I recommend starting with a, a, a no tap? Could be. Make it fun. 
Sure, could be eight pin no tab, could be nine pin no tab, could be three six nine, could be regular bowling, could be something where they get a bowling ball in their hand. I mean, I, I don't know that I recommend any of them. I recommend all of them, okay? Because uh, th those those programs are ones that we know work. The challenge is where do we get people to feed into them? The issue is not that an eight pin or a nine pin or a three six nine or a pizza pins and pop or anything like that doesn't work. It's how do you get people to know about it? How do you get people? This is the feeder program. This is the feeder program to your new developmental leagues that then roll into your more uh, competitive leagues, okay? So any and all of those could absolutely be the, the, the program that you do on there. But keep it fun, keep it fun and, and keep it short on there. Okay, so I, I would tell you that, I will close with this on the 2.0. Um, there are a few programs that come up or a few products that come up in our industry that are really game changers, okay? Uh, I look at automatic scoring, game changer. Uh, bumpers, game changer, right? Um, your, your glow product, whether it's cosmic or extreme, game changer. All of those are, are products that just change the, the industry and open it up to a whole new group. Uh, this isn't quite as flashy and glamorous as this, but this program is a game changer. So much so that, that people from around the world are scurrying to get this and have it translated into multiple languages because it works everywhere. Now it may not work to the same success level, but it works everywhere because the whole idea of sampling is universal. Taking a non-user, letting them sample your product and converting them into a user, it works everywhere. Wherever you are in America or wherever you are in the world, it just, it just works there. So my hope is that you'll have some success with the Bowling 2.0 and uh, give it a shot there because it really is a, a game changer. So thanks for uh, tuning in online and thank you all here at the university for allowing us to uh, put this together.